On July 2, 1934, Crescent Lake Bible Camp opened its first season of Christian camps for young people. This camp was the dream of Arthur Perkins, a Presbyterian minister from Merrill, Wisconsin. Located at Crescent Lake near Rhinelander, Wisconsin, this was his dream of a camp that would be accessible and affordable to young people, but also of a camp that would preach the Word of God, the pure gospel of Jesus Christ from the scriptures without compromise. This camp was not without controversy. In fact, in 1935, charges were brought against Reverend Perkins for his involvement here at this camp. A trial was held, a conviction was secured, and a censure was brought against him. We are here at Crescent Lake Bible Camp for a conference examining the life and legacy of this remarkable servant of Jesus Christ. In our conference, there are seven lectures and four sermons written by Reverend Perkins, delivered by me, Reverend Brian DeYoung, the pastor of Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. This conference is the production of the archivist and historian of the Presbytery of Wisconsin and Minnesota of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church done in conjunction with our good friends from WVCY-TV and with the help of the Crescent Lake board and staff. Hello, I'm Pastor Brian DeYoung, the pastor of Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and we are here at Crescent Lake Bible Camp for the Arthur Perkins Conference on the life and legacy of a truly remarkable man. We're going to be looking this evening at one of Arthur Perkins' sermons. It is entitled, Christ the Ladder, and it is based on Genesis 28, verse 12. This sermon was one of Art Perkins' favorite sermons. He preached it frequently as he traveled around central Wisconsin. So let me begin by reading from the scriptures, and then we will hear the sermon. This is from Genesis 28, from verses 10 through 17. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went to Haran. He came to a certain place and spent the night there, because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. He had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac and the the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Let's pray and ask God's blessing on his word. Lord, we thank you for your word of truth, that it rings true down through the centuries and the millennia, that it comes to us here this evening. And we pray that you would bless this word as it was preached by Arthur Perkins a hundred years ago, and as it is preached here at our conference this night. In Jesus' name, amen. 
A ladder is never used unless there is a need. I have a ladder. It sits against the wall of my garage, and it stays there until I need to climb up into the attic or get on the roof. Ladders are not decorative objects, not things that you put around as conversation starters. They are useful for meeting a need. And when there is a need, certain qualities must enter into the construction of the ladder for it to be of any real value. And two qualities that I would emphasize are, it must be long enough and it must be strong enough. If it's not long enough, it will not meet the need. If it's not strong enough, it cannot support the weight. No, a ladder must be long enough and strong enough to meet the need of the moment. We're going to look this evening first at the need we have, how sin separates. Then we're going to look at man-made ladders. Next, we will consider the true ladder. Is there safety in the true ladder? And then finally, we will look at how the ladder gives us freedom of communication and access. Well, sin began with rebellion against God. God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He created them very good. And they were there enjoying God's blessings and his goodness. But he gave them a test. He said, you may eat of all of the trees of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. And this test given to Adam and Eve meant everything. If they obeyed the test, they would receive God's blessing. If they disobeyed and sinned against God, there would be dire consequences. We know that the serpent entered into that scene. He came to the woman and he began conversing with the woman. Very interesting that he did not go directly to Adam and begin addressing Adam, but he spoke to Eve, to the weaker vessel. And as he spoke to her, he directly and immediately and very boldly contradicted God. The serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. God says you will, I say you won't. And then he questions God's integrity for God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, what did she do? She took the fruit and she ate it. She gave it to her husband and he ate it. The eyes of both of them were opened. They knew that they were naked. And they came under God's wrath because they sinned. They broke that commandment. Now in this scene in the garden, you can see how the devil is immediately trying to drive a wedge between Adam and Eve and God. Trying to call God's integrity into question trying to sow the seeds of doubt and skepticism in their minds. And so when sin works its way through, it does produce a distance, a gap, a separation. We see this in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you. Not only was there separation, but there were other consequences as well. In Romans chapter 3, Paul says, 
for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This was true not only for Adam and Eve, but for all of their posterity, for the entire human race. And then again in Romans chapter 6, for the wages of sin is death. And so sin and death and separation from God come to man because of his rebellion. Because he was willing to entertain Satan and doubt God. As that separation grows, there is a need to bridge the gap between earth and heaven, between man and God. And man senses that need. And men are very clever. They devise all sorts of ways to meet that need, to bridge that gulf. They come up with man-made ladders. And there are five of these man-made ladders that I would like to tell you about. Things that people do thinking this will solve their problem. Now, as I look at these five things, they're not bad in and of themselves. Some of them God has even directly introduced. And yet, they're not the ladder that man needs to overcome the gulf between him and God. The first of these man-made ladders is church membership. Now again, nothing against church membership. It's good to be a member of a church. And it's the normal thing in the Bible that when people are converted, they become members of local churches. But church membership is not a ladder that can support us, that can bridge that gulf between God and man. Just having your name on the roll of some church somewhere, just having a record of good attendance at that church is not enough. It doesn't satisfy God and his requirements. It doesn't take away our sins and remove our guilt and cleanse our corruption from us. So to use church membership as the ladder between man and God, between heaven and earth, is to use a good thing for a purpose it was not intended for. There's a similar type of man-made ladder, which is sometimes called confirmation. It's the idea that you go through, especially young people, go through a series of courses. You have, perhaps, some examinations. You go and appear before the leaders of the church, and you answer their questions. And then if you pass the test, if you finish the class, you're confirmed. And people will say, look, I have gone through the process. I have taken all the required steps. I have my confirmation certificate I can show you. Surely that's enough, isn't it? No, it's not. A confirmation certificate is not enough to solve the problem that we have with the Holy God. Many people throughout history have claimed that they have righteousness and their own righteousness will be the solution to their problem. And the way this is usually stated is something like this. I am a good person. I do good things. I don't act mean towards others. I'm kind. I'm friendly. I'm a good neighbor to other people. I'm a good guy. Most people, if you ask them, will tell you, I'm a good guy. And so my righteousness, my goodness, my upright life is enough to satisfy God, isn't it? Well, it's good to be upright. It's good to be kind and truthful and genuine and sincere. But trying to find our own righteousness, a righteousness of our own making, is never going to satisfy God. In part because the good lives we try to live are never perfect. And even when we are at our best, our good lives, our righteous efforts, 
cannot undo all of the wicked sins we've committed in the past. Now, closely connected to this is yet another man-made ladder. It's the ladder of good works. This is relying not so much on my own inherent goodness as looking at the good things I do. I will try to do good things. I'll try to take actions which will be beneficial to other people. And so I will walk old ladies across the street. I will rake the leaves of my neighbor when he is sick. I will do all of these things, and I will present my list of good actions and say, certainly God must be pleased with all of my good deeds. Now again, good deeds are not bad things when they are properly understood. Good deeds are the fruit and evidence of a true and saving faith. But good deeds can never make us acceptable with God. They can never address our sin problems. Rather, they are to be the outworking of our salvation. So we do good works, not in order to be saved, but because we have been saved. And then another man-made ladder, and this in our own day, is grown in great popularity. And this is the sacrament of baptism. More and more people will say, because I have been water baptized, I am right with God. They believe and they teach something called baptismal regeneration, that when water baptism is applied to a person, it causes regeneration to work, to act, to happen. And this idea of water baptism being the key, the trigger to our salvation, has grown in vast popularity in recent years. But water baptism, even though it was instituted by our Savior himself, is not the ladder that connects earth and heaven. And so it's not church membership. It's not the process of confirmation. It's not our own righteousness. It's not our own record of good works. And it is certainly not our baptism. In fact, all of these ladders, which are made by man, are not long enough and cannot be strong enough. So is there a true ladder? Is there a safe ladder? Is there any ladder that is long enough and strong enough to meet the need of fallen sinful men? In John chapter 1, verse 51, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. In that statement, our Lord Jesus Christ is referencing back to Jacob's dream of the ladder. And Jesus is telling us in no uncertain terms that he is the ladder between heaven and earth, between God and man. Jesus Christ is the safe ladder. When Jesus left heaven and came to earth and was incarnate, he was a man, a true man, a real man. In fact, in some ways, he was more of a man than any of us here tonight are. And the reason I say that is because true humanity, as God originally created and intended it, was not sinful or fallen. Adam and Eve enjoyed true humanity for that brief period in the garden before their fall. But then they lost that through their sin, and sin always dehumanizes us. 
Jesus Christ comes as the second Adam, the last Adam, and he recaptures true humanity. He is the real man. Now that doesn't mean that he is not also the true and real God. When Jesus came to earth to take on human flesh, he did not stop being God. He did not leave his deity behind in heaven and come to earth as only a man. But throughout his earthly life, he was both God and man. He was the God-man, fully God, fully man. And as the man, the God-man, he was available and accessible to us. This is the real point of the incarnation. He comes down and dwells among us and becomes like us so that we can have access to him and through him. Any good ladder has its bottom rung fairly close to the ground. If you go to the store and buy a ladder and the first rung is like eight feet up, that ladder's not gonna do you any good. You have to have it close to the ground so that you can actually reach it, so it's accessible to you. And Jesus, as a man, is accessible to us. He is like us in every way, yet without sin. Jesus Christ was also a perfect man, a sinless man. He was righteous. He obeyed all of God's commands all of the time in word and in deed, in the spirit and in the letter. He obeyed every aspect of each and every command simultaneously. His obedience was thoroughgoing and without any flaw or fault whatsoever. Now, if you focus your attention on one area, maybe you have a sinful struggle with maybe stealing, and you pour all of your energy into really keeping that command Thou shalt not steal. Pretty difficult. And it just creeps in from all sorts of different angles. And so for us to have a record of obedience that honors just one of the commandments is nigh unto impossible. Think about the fact that Jesus kept every single commandment all the time personally, perfectly, perpetually. And through this, he achieved a righteousness, a righteousness which he then gives to us, which is imputed to us, and we receive through faith alone. Jesus' perfection is remarkable. When you look at literature, you do not see this. Novels do not depict perfect men. When you read poetry, you don't find perfect men in poetry. Dramatists do not present us with the perfect man. People always have feet of clay. And even when they try to hide those flaws, the truth inevitably comes out. And so you have the perfect man, Jesus Christ, doing what no other human being has ever do, done. In John 8, verse 46, he asks, Which of you convicteth me of sin? And none of them could answer. Pilate, as he looked at Christ, could find no fault in him. Jesus never, ever sinned. But you know, Jesus' life and ministry really came to its culmination when he died upon the cross. In the Bible, we find weeks and sometimes months of his 
earthly ministry that are left out, that we know nothing about. But we know practically every single detail of that last week of his life. Why is that? It's because this was the apex of his redemptive work. This is what he came to earth to do, to die as a sacrifice upon the cross. Every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are doing so in remembrance of his death for us. You know, we never remember the death days of other people. We don't memorialize them. When you think about the great men of history, we don't know when Winston Churchill died, I mean, off the top of our heads. We don't have an annual celebration of the day Winston died. But we're very keyed into this, the death of Jesus, because it's so utterly essential for our whole salvation. As people think and talk about the death of Christ, they sometimes ask questions. Was it the death of a suicide? The answer is no. He did not take his own life. Was his death a horrible accident? No, it wasn't. It was very purposeful and deliberate. Was it the death of a criminal? No, his death was not that of a criminal, although he was crucified between two criminals. Was it the death of a martyr? No, Jesus is not a martyr. But rather, it was the death of a sacrifice, a willing sacrifice who laid down his life, an atonement for sin. Not only did Jesus die on the cross, but Jesus rose again from the dead. And this, too, is absolutely essential for us. In 1 Corinthians 15, we read this. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. This is the very heart of the Christian gospel, that Jesus Christ died, on the cross, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again from the dead, according to the scriptures. And the resurrection of Christ is the foundation of all our hopes. It was the foundation of Arthur Perkins' hope on a very particular matter. He had a daughter, Doris, who was very special to him. He loved her deeply. When Doris was almost 10 years old, she went with her daddy to the West Granville Presbyterian Church to conduct a vacation Bible school. That church is located on a rather busy street. It's called, in some of the reports, a highway. And as they were there, getting out of the car, walking along the road, an inexperienced driver drove his automobile, hit Doris, and she was critically injured. Two hours later, she died in a hospital, Arthur at her side. That death of his dear daughter, Doris, hurt him very profoundly. And yet his hope for Doris was in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Just as Jesus rose from the dead, he believed Doris would rise again as well. It seems that she had a sweet spirit and perhaps was a believer. And so his hope is not just 
a grieving parent grasping at straws for something, but it's the hope of a Christian that our loved ones who die will be raised again because Jesus rose from the dead. And so the hope of Arthur Perkins for Doris was in the resurrection. And then also, Jesus ascended into heaven. In Acts chapter 1, verse 9, we read, After he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Jesus, who had come, who had lived, who had taught, who had suffered, who had died and risen, ascended into heaven, the glorious and victorious Redeemer, who came back to the cheers of the angels and the saints glorified. And in heaven he reigns, ever living to make intercession for his people. All of those man-made ladders that are tried by human beings to bridge the gap do nothing to help the spiritual problem of mankind. But Jesus Christ is the ladder who is long enough, who is strong enough, and through him we gain access to communion with God. You know, a bridge or a ladder must be safe throughout if it is to be used, if it is to be trusted. A Jesus Christ who is not quite God is a bridge broken at the further end. And so when theologians and pastors and academics and candidates for the ministry, deny the deity of Jesus Christ, they are taking away the only ladder that can meet the need. Now, in climbing a ladder, we need to do two things. We need to grasp, and we need to step. We grasp by faith, and we step in obedience. And so you can lean your whole weight upon Jesus. He will never fail you. As you grasp him by faith, you will find him solid and certain and sure and trustworthy. And as you step in obedience, you will find that his ways are perfect and pure and good and right. And so I would encourage and challenge you, if you have not grasped Jesus Christ by faith, that you would do so tonight, that you would turn to him and trust in him with all your heart and soul and strength. And if you are trusting him, then you must also live in obedience to him. He is your king. He is your Lord. He is your leader. And you should follow him, because this is his will for you. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that Christ is the ladder, that he meets the need, that you, O oh Jesus, are long enough and strong enough, and that through you we can have access with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we can enjoy the glories and beauties and blessings of eternal life in heaven. We pray it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for your attention to this video and this conference. I trust that it has been of spiritual encouragement and help to you, and that it has given you some historical data that you were not aware of. There will be a biography of Arthur Perkins forthcoming, the title is Standing Against Tyranny, The Life and Legacy of Arthur Perkins. I am the author, and it will be published through Amazon.com. Lord willing, we will also have an audiobook available for that. For information, please contact me 
Brian DeYoung at Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church, 4930 Green Valley Lane, Sheboygan, Wisconsin, 53083. Thank you.